Phyllis Sagano, thank you for joining us on Common Home TV. I'm happy to be with you, Matt. Good to see you. Good to see you again. Um, what are your initial thoughts on the outcome and the processes of the final stage of the Plenary Council in Australia? Well, you know, it's uh, I'm not Australian, and I, I hesitate to uh, criticize the processes. You've had plenary councils, I think, since 1885. Um, from what I understand, the, it was a two-part vote with a consultative vote, which was everybody, some 241 members, and then a deliberative vote, uh, which was bishops only. <clears throat> and of course, I was interested in, in Section 4 on women, and uh, I... I, I can't say I was surprised that the initial document failed for many reasons. Um, and the the document that eventually passed, I, I can see where there would be objections, uh, but I could see where it might be the sort of compromise that could be done in this climate. Um, I understand the Sydney bishops were leading the opposition to the word ordination and that that was the biggest problem in the uh, original document. Mm. Well, that's that's interesting. I'll skip ahead to that question. It's um, a good segue. You, you read over section four, what it was and what it ended up. Uh, how do you see as an academic? Because I think in the spirit of the moment, what happened there was monumentous, monumentous. And I think that it's, it shouldn't be uh, downplay just the the courage and the the spirit that moved everyone to 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 get where they finally were. But that being said, with an academic eye, do you see the that there was anything watered down in the final section and the changes? Is there anything that sticks out to you that says, "Oh, we we lost something there um, in in so much as we got wrapped up in synodality," or or is it a better written document? Well. Um, I think it's, uh, on the one hand, a better written document because it's it's got less, I hate to say extraneous material, but it, it is clearer and to the point in terms of what was lost uh, was the word ordination. And, and I can understand where people uh, on both sides would vote against uh, the first document because of the word ordination and against the second document because it doesn't have the word ordination. Mm. But in any event, the compromise that seems to have been uh, reached is that should the universal law of the church change, the uh, 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 the, the bishops in Australia are, are willing to work to see how that can be, be implemented in, in Australia. Now, by, by commenting on the universal law of the church, uh, that goes directly to Canon 1024, which says only a baptized male is validly ordained. And uh, that would be the universal law of the church that would need to be changed. Uh, there have been a couple of other laws already changed. Uh, I don't know the numbers of the canons, but the, well, I do actually, uh, but it doesn't matter. The canon, the canon that says uh, only, a, bapt only a, a male uh, can be informally installed as lector or acolyte. Um, it, it, it's been changed to say now that any lay person can be installed to the lay ministries of lector and acolyte. Now, these two lay ministries are required uh, before uh, ordination as deacon. So uh, I think someone once told me there are maybe four or five different canons that would have to change when the church uh, uh, accepts the restoration of women to the ordained diaconate. And for sure, these are two uh, canons that would have needed to be changed and no longer need to be changed uh, because uh, the universal law of the church is now that uh, women as well as men can be formally installed to the lay ministries of lector and acolyte. And in fact, that is happening uh, in different dioceses around the world, some in South America, some in Italy. The Pope himself installed women and men as uh, as lectors, <clears throat> not as acolytes in uh, in St. Peter's. So um, the church, as you know, uh, doesn't turn on a dime. So no, so we can't. So it 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 will take a while. But I think I think it's a, it's an interesting thing. So when you have the bishops, and I, I on the vote there were um, on the final vote, uh, one uh, 37 bishops were pl placid pleased, um, and they needed 32. Um, one said he would be okay with it with some certain modifications and five said they weren't pleased. Now, uh, Father Frank Brennan yesterday in his homily 
uh, made the point that where is the transparency? I don't think that's the word he, he used, but that's how I interpret it. Where is the transparency if the bishops do not stand up and say what they're not pleased about? Uh, what would they want modified? So, so your synodal process, as far as it, it goes now, is is very interesting. The um, the extraordinary moment uh, last Wednesday when fully 25% of the members, including two bishops, uh, stood at the end of the uh, at the side of the room after the tea break uh, after the first vote failed on on this fourth section, and refused to take their seats. I mean that's that's. Yeah. Uh, that's that's yeah. pretty striking. Yep. Uh, and and if you if you saw happen to see Elizabeth Young's article in yesterday's uh, Sydney Times, there was a terrible terrible thing. I, I remember getting texts about it uh, last week, and I said, you know, have they lost their mind? I mean, <laughs> the bishops of Australia are voting that women are not made in the image and likeness of God, basically. Mm -hmm. They're voting that women cannot image Christ. And that's a terrible statement. It also happens to be heretical. But uh, uh, I, I think it was uh, saved. Um, <clears throat> uh, the day was saved, but the wound is still there. And I think that the women of the church in the, throughout the world, as well as in Australia, um, know uh, now better how um, clergy feel about them uh, and uh, so the Australian bishops have done a great, a great service to the, uh, the women of the world who have been complaining about clericalism for a long time. Mm -hmm. And this, this combined with the fact that the uh, bishops did not uh, stand up and say who was opposed and what they were opposed to. Now, it's entirely possible that uh, the five uh, bishops who voted that they weren't pleased wanted the word ordination back in the document. But in any event, the, the word ordination is implied by the change in the universal law of the church. So um, either way, it's it's a step and uh, people can debate whether it's a big or small step, bigger or smaller step. We, we spoke with uh, with uh, John Warhurst, who's a professor, and he said, yeah, he straight out said, it's, of course, it's a lack of transparency and uh, named it named it for what he thought it was. And uh, I understand the Catholic media putting its best foot forward about synodality because of how also people in the room felt drawn to the spirit that the, the protest wasn't one, um, of course, wounds, of course, wounds, of course, anger, of course, sadness, but it, it was one where I was tough. These were tough ladies and it was a female led movement. And I'm just, I don't want to say concerned, but I just find it weird that we're not championing, champ we're not being the champion of looking back at that and going, wow this is something that we should be telling people about like the the bishops stood with them the men stood with them men didn't hijack we're often pretty i'm that type of guy i'm very you know vocal i'm, I'm ready get me in the game coach type thing but no what they the, the women led this thing uh that to me showed the real synodality and i think there's a lot to be said about um the courage in those women and i hope that that's being portrayed at least in the american press in some of the american press I haven't seen anything in the American press about this at all. Uh, it, it will come out eventually. You know, uh, you have to be really following the synod uh, to find out what's going on around the world. You know, Belgium uh, seems to be supporting women deacons. France seems to be supporting women deacons. Germany certainly is. They have a far more developed document than was voted uh, on in, that failed in, 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 um, in Australia. Uh, and, and countries around the world, I, I think the Spanish speaking countries are, are getting with the program, if I may, certainly in, in Central and Latin America. So, um, but in the United States, the Synod has been, um, in my diocese, we, we joke about the secret Synod uh, because nobody knows about it and nobody really uh, has heard anything about it. Uh, I, I know one local parish did have a secret synod meeting. The pastor invited a few people. And I understand that's what was done in this diocese. The bishop said, just get, you know, your men's club or something and mm -hmm. write a one page report. Other dioceses in the United States, particularly in the archdiocese in Newark, went uh, full press on and, and had special meetings for all, all sorts of, of groups. And I am told that in every single meeting, not in the Spanish speaking in Newark, but, but in all uh, every other uh, type of group, 
um, the ordination of women to the diaconate uh, came up, and in some instances, ordination to the to the priesthood. Uh, now, at at the get go, it was said that doctrine was not under discussion. So, um, but people may not understand that. So, so uh, I, I am hopeful with the uh, the results, certainly of the Australian uh, Plenary Council, with the results of of uh, other other countries, and and we'll just wait to see what happens in the United States. You know, at the beginning, only half of the U.S. bishops even appointed someone to run their synod when they were asked directly by uh, Cardinal Grech. And uh, <clears throat> since that time, almost all of them have appointed someone, but uh, the the results, uh, which are supposed to have been already posted on diocesan websites, are just not there. I mean, I saw Buffalo's uh, results uh, recently, but <clears throat> it's it's very difficult to find out what's going on. Well, that's, and, that's, that's interesting. Like, I'd like to uh, explore a little bit more about what it means for the future. And I think we're both Northeast. I think everyone from Philly to Montreal, uh, pretty direct talk. And you want to case the language in something, not more flowery, but more synodal, right? Because we want everyone to be on the same page. It's not, it's not the attack, but... How else do you say shots fired in a way that makes it like these women stood up and said, look, we're not going to be steamrolled. Um, do you see that as having uh, the potential for a far reaching effect in places like Germany that are um, that are dealing with their synod in the future that these bishops have seen? Oh, you know, in the Australian context, when when it was flat, when when the, the bishops gave the, a rejection, the actual people stood up and said, well, well it's well, I can't, you know, I can't, I can't decide what will happen in Germany. I think they've done a fine job, and they have a different, uh, different program, and they have uh, uh, scholars and academics uh, 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 broken into various groups according to topic, and uh, so I, I wouldn't comment on uh, on Germany uh, or the process, or certainly France or or any place else that I've read the results. I can tell you that in the United States, the it's a big country. We have 197 um, dioceses or eparchies. They are broken into 15 regions. Uh, apparently what is happening is that the individual dioceses are, have a regional team uh, and the regional team will then write a report from the diocesan reports and the uh, 15 regional reports will then go to Washington where they will be again boiled down to a 10 page report. And then the outliers, the uh, maybe um, as many as 100 uh, Catholic groups such as discerning deacons, uh, future church uh, and, and others of that, of that nature uh, as well as individual religious orders and uh, and other kinds of Catholic groupings, they are able to submit or were able to submit their uh, their <clears throat> ten page documents to a so called Region 16, which is directly to Washington D.C. And there are staffers of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops who will uh, collate and somehow quantify the problem. Of course, with with synodality, uh, which uh, uh, which really, really was well known in 2016 with the Synod on Youth is how does one um, uh, qu quantify qualitative responses? Um, and uh, I, 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 we just have to wait and see. The Vatican says that each diocese is to uh, post its diocesan report uh, and the names of the writers uh, well in advance of June 30th um, so that the people of the diocese can comment and read. I am not aware of that having happened any place. Um, and uh, I imagine uh, the, that I hope the USCCB will post its report in advance of August 16th, uh, 15th, which is when it is due in, in Rome. But but you don't know. So I, so I think the problem with synodality is the problem of transparency. And the the uh, uh, what is evident in the uh, Australian experience is that the bishops are still. I, I saw the uh, I saw the phrase the bishops are still the landlords uh, and we are the serfs. 
you know, um, and and that is, I think, what what needs to be uh, overcome uh, as soon as possible, because uh, you speak about women and the women are presenting very well, uh, certainly in in the, in the Australian Synod, where they many of them were, refused to sit down, as I mm. said earlier order of the of the uh, council of plenary assembly but women are are walking away and they're taking their husbands and children and certainly their checkbooks with them so um, the bishops can uh, rant and rave and say that they do not uh, feel that I, I think that I, I want to get the exact title of the of the uh, the document witnessing the equal dignity of women and men they can they can vote again against the equal dignity of women and men, which is what they did uh, in the first vote. Uh, and in the second vote, the um, title of that section was still witnessing to the equal dignity of women and men. But the, the fact remains that the bishops of Australia voted against a document entitled witnessing to the equal dignity of women and men. So if that is their position, they will have a church all their own, but there will be no people. And also the lack of the, the priesthood is harder to find um, natively, I should say, like people born in Australia. So it becomes remaking a church in an image past rather than welcoming fully. I don't understand how that's a, um, something that in the future in a, in a, in a Western society is going to make any a welcoming. Well, I mean, if, you, if you're talking about immigrant, immigrant priests, Australia's always had immigrant priests. It had priests from Scotland and Ireland in the time of Mary MacKillop. Um, and uh, they uh, took charge just as well as, as oh, we, perhaps we, we, other. The Redemptress, is, uh, we're a Redemptress funded apostolate, and we have a, the, the greatest bunch of young guys, but my heart goes out to them as well. Uh, that, that wasn't meant to be disparaging. My heart goes out to them as well because um, they're younger, right? And the, the census just came out in Australia, and you just see the rise of the gnomes and the decline of, of religious. Now, for a 40, 50-year-old priest, they're here for another long time. And uh, I, I think that it's it's unfair to them to, to not do everything best to have a flourishing community, because in 20 years, a lot of these 70, 80-year-old men won't be around. But the older I get, I know 50 is not old. I know 60 is not old. You, you start thinking... In, in their, their sort of in that stage of their life, um, you don't want to have empty churches. That doesn't, I don't think that helps anybody. I don't think that really restore, not just does it not restore, it's not life giving to the priests themselves. Well, I would distinguish between religious and secular clergy. And I think a lot of the problem of clericalism rests in the seminary system that instills in secular clergy a, uh, oftentimes a, uh, uh, to me, an odd ecclesiology, uh, and a uh, uh, and places them uh, away from the people of God, and and, and it, it's uh, that's not to say that they are not uh, in a certain sense socially sequestered. It is more to uh, to say that they need to understand that uh, lay people uh, and uh, are are human too. And, and this, I keep coming back to this, you know, in the, uh, as you know, I was on the uh, first uh, pontifical commission for the study of women in the diaconate and two, two members, two officers uh, or officials of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith told me that women could not be ordained because women cannot image Christ. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I said, that was very interesting. I'd never heard that before, but I would write a book about it. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> Um, it's called Women Icons of Christ, and 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 that that if that is their if that is their modicum uh, their modus operandi, well, they're thinking about uh, the statement of Thomas Aquinas, who said that uh, women and slaves can't be ordained. Uh, so uh, you know, um, I, I beg to differ with Thomas Aquinas. I was thinking about this the other day. I think the problem came, Matt. I think the problem arose. Uh, really in the 12th, 13th century, around the time of Aquinas, when ordination, the whole, the whole theology of ordination began to be um, developed, but also when something called the cursus honorum was codified. And, 
And the cursus honorum, as you may know, is are the steps uh, by the time of the Middle Ages where you would be tonsured and then you would be a, a porter, uh, porter, lector, exorcist, acolyte, uh, those minor orders, and then ordained to this major order of subdeacon, the major order of deacon, and then the major order of priest. But what happened, you see, around the 10th, 11th, 12th century, around the time Thomas Aquinas was equating women and slaves, uh, we we have um, uh, we have a, a, an eventuation where no person, no man, obviously, could be ordained as a deacon unless he was on the way to priesthood. So the diaconate really died out, and uh, as a permanent as a permanent vocation. And uh, meanwhile, here, there, and everywhere, women were still ordained as deacons. We know in Lucca in north northern Italy. Um, Otoni probably didn't get the me memo, but he was still ordaining women as deacons into the 11th, into the 12th century. But but my point is that the social service deacons among the women died out, uh, and they were mostly monastic deacons. And eventually, that the need for them uh, died out in the West. In, in the East, it maintained itself a lot longer, and of course, it's coming back in the East uh, a lot quicker as well. Well, this might sound like uh, flippant. But um, would not traditionalists, because that's right, the ninth century, uh, the 12th century in Northern Italy, uh, you said the town, I just say Northern Italy. But Luca. Uh, yeah, right. Um, if you wanted to be a traditionalist, how much more traditional is that? You want to harken back to the old Latin times. There it is, 12th century Northern Italy. Let's uh, ordain female deacons. I don't know why that, that wouldn't be something that could be um, pitched. because it's Well, the Holy Father has said that the, the church is not a museum, but you know, uh, we also have to remember that, the, you know, the good steward takes from his storehouse, from his treasury, things new and old. And uh, uh, I, th I really believe that if the church finds a need for ordained women uh, uh, deacons, it will not be denied. And I think uh, uh, the Holy Father is moving slowly and carefully. Uh, he's also trying to expand our church. You know, Matt, uh, we... we if we uh, can only insist on ordaining women, we're, we're not seeing a vision of ecclesiology that I think Francis presented after the Amazon Synod with Great Amazonia, mm. where he, um, uh, he said, you know, we have to pay attention. You know, two thirds of the parishes in the Amazons are, are, are led by women, mostly women religious. And he said to, it would be important to recover and recall uh, in so many words, uh, Canon 517, paragraph two, which allows for what are called parish life coordinators. And, and the fact of the matter is, and I'm sure you have these in Australia as well, uh, the parish life coordinator, uh, he said, needs to be given a term of office and professionalized and accepted and uh, uh, recognized by the bishop uh, and by implication paid. Um, and the parish life coordinator wouldn't necessarily be uh, an ordained person, male or female, uh, married or not married, uh, uh, a religious, uh, a, uh, uh, a religious man or woman. So I, I, I think now, if, if you have a sister who is a parish life coordinator and has a vocation to the diaconate, then fine. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and 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 with that, there is the uh, in Great Amazonia, he did not pick up on ordaining married men as married deacons as as priests. I think that's very important in his uh, ecclesial mindset because as soon as you have a priest on the on the block, he's in charge. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I don't see the reason, uh, and it could happen, where Jack the plumber, who's a lovely deacon and married and has five kids, is ordained a priest and all of a sudden runs the parish instead of the woman religious who is the parish life coordinator. So I think that you have to really turn turn your mind around this and understand that uh, the distinction between the person who manages the parish, holds it together, and the sacramental ministers. Now, the person who manages the parish and, and holds it together could be a sacramental minister or not. Uh, if it's if that person is not a sacramental minister, then that's that person's job to uh, to find sacramental ministers for the people of God. I've, I've spoken to sisters who manage parishes not only in Brazil, but in or in in South America and Central America, but in India and Africa, and they said we don't want to be we don't want to be 
priests. We want to be deacons so that we uh, we can better serve our people. Um, and uh, particularly, a sister from Brazil said, you know, if if I can't do the wedding, if I can't do the baptism, um, if if I really can't do the formal exequies of the funeral, um, they're going to go next door to the evangelical minister mm-hmm. uh, because they want something church. They want something that is. Uh, uh, ratified in the eyes of God. And while they may have been brought up Catholic, well, the evangelical Christianity is, I guess, okay. If there's no sacraments, what's the difference, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, well, just shifting gears a little bit about other ways of expressing the growth of women in the church. The, I felt this kind of went under the radar. I was speaking to a, a priest that I work with, and, and when he mentioned it, I was like, how did I not read that? But the new constitution in the Holy See that admits that has come into effect to allow baptized Catholics, including women and men, to head uh, Vatican departments. Do you think this will shape uh, the culture in the Vatican itself, uh, its impact on equality for women? And basically, we know. I think we probably know that m- m- a lot of this stuff is uh, it's new. So once it's new, it proliferates. And I think having people in those positions, what do you think that their what do you think that their impact of having those positions will be? Well, there's a learning curve. You know, um, these are hothouse clerics in many cases who haven't worked anyplace else, and now they need to learn to work with women. Um, I have, uh, I understand that the, some of the cardinals on the Council for the Economy have been astonished at the brilliance of uh, some of the women who are now members of the Council for the Economy. Uh, as you may know, the Holy Father is um, about to appoint two women uh, to the uh, mem- to be members of the dicastery for bishops, which in essence is his his uh, his personnel office. I mean, uh, but uh, I think having a couple of women to uh, take a look at the dossier of the uh, uh, the priests who are presented as candidates for, for Episcopal uh, appointment and ordination, I think it's very, very good and very, very, very uh, prescient. However, that's management. That's not ministry. Mm-hmm. So uh, and so to move women into management may uh, help help the bishops learn how to work with women. I mean, quite seriously. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I think you know uh, you you probably uh, could say it's analogous of uh, women in, in military services or naval services. It, yeah. it takes a while for the uh, the men to accept the fact that a woman can be in the wardroom, a woman can be an officer. So um, so so I think it as I say it it's it's a slow process. He certainly appointed a few women. He's appointed a woman as secretary of the uh, um, dicastery for uh, integral human development, uh, working with Cardinal Cherney, who's just been affirmed as uh, as its prefect. Uh, I don't know that you'll see a, a lay person as prefect. You might see a lay person as prefect for the uh, dicastery for the laity or the dicastery for culture. Uh, I think it'd be too much of a, of a seismic shock to see a, a, a lay person as prefect for the uh, dicastery for bishops or the dicastery for worship and sacraments or the dicastery for clergy now. Uh, but again, as I said, particularly with with bishops and with clergy, these these well mostly bishops. It's a personnel office, and uh, these people uh, are making recommendations to the Holy Father, who does the appointing. Um, so, uh, uh, and then get the priests. I mean, there there are hundreds of priests working in in the Vatican. Get them out to do priest work. If we mm. have such a shortage of yeah. priests, mm-hmm. why are all these fellows hanging around Rome? Um, and he has he has said this uh, by uh, by means of uh, saying you've got a five year term, maybe five years renewable, but after that you're toast, you know you're gone. Uh, so he is talking about rotating um, rotating the priest personnel certainly, and uh, I imagine that would uh, that would apply to the uh, the lay people as well. Or that there's there's a problem there because of Roman law. Uh-huh. That once you have a job, you really can't get fired. So I don't know how that's that's going to work out. Uh, I think the uh, uh, I think that's why what we're seeing more sisters uh, appointed as uh, uh, as members of as officials in dicasteries, um, uh, because to be a member of a dicastery, it's a, it's basically a part time job. The, the two women who will be named to 
the dicastery for bishops uh, will be invited to meetings, I think actually twice a month. Uh, they're held by Zoom, but most people try to get there at least once a month, probably not in the summer uh, and not around Christmas. <clears throat> but that's that's in addition to one's other, other positions. So, uh, uh, so you don't have to worry about uh, coming afoul of Roman law if you put women as consultors mm -hmm. or members of, and, and women have been made consultors. Of course, now the other side of the story is, I know women who are consultors to the Congregation for the Doctrine of the, of, uh, the Faith, or excuse me, the dicastery now for the Doctrine of the Faith. And it's very nice that they're consultors, but nobody's consulting them, so. Mm. Um, I've watched many, many of your clips and read a lot of stuff. And there's one question you get all the time, and I promise I won't ask it to you. And that is, well, why not women in the priesthood? You've explained that many times. So I want to ask that question. What I will ask is, why not cardinal? Well, I've written uh, actually as an essay. There's nothing against women cardinals. Uh, the uh, the last lay cardinal, uh, Theophila Merkel, uh, died around the uh, turn of the uh, 20th century. He was a lawyer, and, uh, and uh, he also was uh, responsible for Vatican money. Um, he was he was tonsured. When, so he's not exactly a lay cardinal. He was tonsured when he was about 30, but much later he was named a cardinal while he was not ordained. And it was after he was named a cardinal that he was ordained a deacon. Um, I've often said it's easier to have women cardinal deacons than, uh, than lay cardinals simply for that fact, um, because we still have the ranks of cardinals, cardinal deacon, cardinal uh, priest, and cardinal, uh, cardinal bishop. Now, a woman cardinal deacon would be able to participate in a conclave and would be able to elect the pope. I'm not here to tell you that she would be um, elected pope, um, pace pope Joan, but but I think that uh, just the fact of a woman's vote in mm. the conclave would give uh, give great, great credence to what comes out of it. Uh, just as at least Natalie Beckhart who is one of the two undersecretaries to the Senate of Bishops, just as uh, Nectali Beckhart will have a vote at the Senate, and I imagine some other women will. I think it would give credence to the October 2023 uh, Senate results, which um, if, if women deacons are edited out of that, or if there's a vote that edits um, any mention of women in the diaconate out of that Senate, that will be the end of women in the church uh, because there's no argument against ordaining women as deacons. The arguments against women as priests, which you've not asked about, uh, inter in Signoris in 1976 said women can't be priests because Jesus chose male apostles and because of the, uh, um, the iconic argument, women, women must image Christ. Well, in 1994, with uh, Ordinatio Sacerdotalis on the same topic, the iconic argument was dropped because it's indefensible. And uh, the only argument in 1994 uh, is that uh, Jesus chose male apostles. Well, okay, Jesus chose male apostles, but Jesus didn't ordain anybody. Ordination didn't come into the fore until around the second century. But that's where I revert to the comments earlier about seminary formation, because I will tell you that I sat in uh, the local seminary up in Yonkers for the Archdiocese of New York, the Diocese of Brooklyn, the Diocese of Rockville Center, and had some first year men explain to me uh, that Jesus ordained um, the apostles at the, at the first, at the Last Supper. Uh, and I said, I, I, I didn't know that. Where did you learn that? They said, well, did you ever hear of Fulton Sheen? So apparently they're using Fulton Sheen, uh, who was a television uh, evangelist priest in the 1950s uh, for uh, liturgical and historical formation in that seminary. And, and, and I think that's, that's just silly. Um, but that, that is, is what has been put into the minds of, uh, of uh, seminarians who um i think are just badly formed and the church is is really badly served by by their poor formation um do you think the danger to the movement for women ordination lies in our inability to convince an all-male uh clergy priesthood um, bishops and cardinals 
Or do you think the danger at this point is coming from apathy? The decline in numbers and the, the lack of passion from people in the views, um, aging populations in the West. Well, I think, I think the views of priests and bishops have created apathy uh, uh, toward the, uh, the church and the uh, means that are being used to, um, to create excitement um, are smells and bells and lace. And uh, that, that's, that's a very serious um, a rejection of the Second Vatican II. Certainly you're aware mm -hmm. of, of uh, Tradiciones Custodis, which, which uh, has since been uh, strengthened. And the Holy Father said, speaking to, uh, I believe priests in Sicily, you don't have to wear your grandmother's lace. Um, the, the problem is not with the Tridentine Mass so much as the problem is with the rejection of the Second Vatican Council. And yeah. the use of the Tridentine Mass is part of that rejection. Yeah. So, uh, um, I mean, uh, if you if you go to uh, some of our Eastern Catholic churches, the masses are uh, very much smells and bells and gold and, and all sorts of uh, uh, long uh, ceremonies. Um, but but for the Latin Church, which is the predominant uh, membership of the uh, Roman Catholic Church. We call it the Roman Catholic Church, although the Eastern Churches, 21, 22, 23 of them are joined to us. Um, <clears throat> the majority of people uh, on the planet, the 1.2 billion Catholics, are Roman Catholic. And, uh, and I think it's very uh, serious uh, business to reject the Second Vatican Council, which is the highest authority now, 60 years. It takes about 100 years to get to get to accept a council, but we're 60 years in, mm -hmm. and a lot of people are trying to revert uh, uh, revert to the days of Fulton Sheen and uh, and as I said earlier, smells and bells and lots of incense, and that that's just um, uh, it's nostalgic. It's it's black and white TV. It's it's a, a an imagined. Does, does past. it strike you odd? Does it strike you odd that it's at least for me? I'm seeing this push not come from uh, a reactionary older crowd that says make make something great again. To use that sort of like oh, when I was a kid, this was great. A lot of this is coming from young people, and that's why I'm really struggling to get my head around because, like my mom said, like you weren't there. I wasn't like I didn't really like not knowing what the priest was saying all the time. Like this new um, push isn't only from people that feel Vatican II has gone too far because they lived through Vatican II, but some of it's coming from younger priests and and parishioners saying like we need to veil ourselves and as you said with the the instead of preaching the homily to reach your everyday life to look back to a time that we don't. We have, younger people have no idea what that was like. Well, this is why I, I uh, spoke earlier about poor formation in seminaries, because those are the younger priests coming out. Um, and, and they have, uh, some of them, very strange formation and very poor formation. Uh, and so you're, I, I see, at least in the United States and in other countries, almost uh, two tracks, you know, the, the traditional religious orders, the Redemptors certainly, um, and, and the Jesuits, uh, Franciscans. Um, I, I see their better formation and better training, uh, whereas the secular priests in, in, in many respects are oriented only towards sacrament. And that's that's what they do. And that's their entire identity. Whereas the religious priest sees himself um, inserted into the community, first of all, of his religious order, but also inserted into the community of the parish if he is so assigned. So um, I, I think that tension is there. And there are plenty of younger people uh, in Jesuit volunteer corps in you know, mm -hmm. redemptorist uh, ministries, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and also in the um, in the lay uh, the lay orders, the, the Lasallian uh, Christian brothers certainly I think is is if not the biggest one of the biggest uh, uh, groups of, of brothers in in the world, and they have a tremendous number of young people all over the world very excited about church. So if you go to World Youth Day, I don't think you're going to see that many 
uh, chapel veils, um, and I think you'll see more T-shirts um, and jeans than uh, than um, more traditional uh, kinds of people. But it, but again, I say I don't it uh, it it doesn't bother me if people wish to belong to a different right. Exactly. To me, the tri the Tridentine uh, crowd might as well be uh, think of them like the Maronites or the Melkites or the Greek Catholics. But where they are criticizing exactly. uh, the Holy Father, uh, where they are criticizing the Second Vatican Council, um, I it's think not the language, right? It's not that the it's not that speaking Latin is something that offends me. If you want to worship in Latin and brings you closer to God, why would I possibly object? It's what you're saying. It's the other things that that seem to go part and parcel that are the, the issue, right? So I don't think Pope Francis is just a, an anti-Latinite, but that's a word. <laughs> but you know, like it's the things you're saying that go along with that detract from our ability to um, be serious about a future. I just want to thank you for your tireless work for all of that. And uh, just to let that be known. And uh, thank you very much. And we appreciate your time. Happy to be with you, Matt, anytime. Good luck. Yeah.